Good welcome everyone. This is the School District of Prescott Board of Education regular meeting. We have been in closed session since 5.30. We are on item five, our call this meeting. This open session subject to section 1983 Wisconsin statutes, call that to order. Our next item here is to adopt the agenda. And I think we had one change that we're just gonna do right now. Um, administration is asking the early college to be pulled out of consent. Yeah. So I Roman numeral five in consent. We're gonna to move to item D for school business. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Uh, anything else to change? No, nope. everything else is the same. All right, we'll need a motion to adopt the agenda with the change. I move to approve the agenda um, as presented and as noted, move uh, Roman numeral five from consent to D under business. I'll second. Motion is second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries, we're on item seven, Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lena. Uh, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to recognition of visitors. Uh, rule for public comment are as follows. Please approach the podium one at a time, stating your name, municipality, and topic you'd like to address. <laughs> A lot of time is three minutes per individual or six if you're representing a group. Comments should be directed to the board and not to the staff or other participants. The board will not act on any comments that are made during the meeting. The presiding officer may direct the district administrator to follow up with that individual at a later date. And lastly, the public comment section will be limited to 30 minutes unless board action is taken to extend. And for a full review of our public comment, please see our public comment policy uh, for a full description. Anybody in the audience, please uh, approach the point if you care to be recognized. Good morning, or good morning, good evening, guys. I'm um, Stuart Polk, um, father of some students here in Prescott. And uh, this, to say least, as you guys are probably aware, the board increasingly more concerned about this board and this district. Um, every school board meeting that I've viewed either online or in person here, uh, social media postings, presentations, um, I've seen more and more concern about our you know, referendum that's coming up. Um, everything that you guys have said is basically the need has been because of the state not giving more funding to the school and inflation. I think we can all kind of agree on that. This district has failed to mention to the public though is what effects Act 11 and 19 has had on this district and the additional funding they have received. In my research, I found out that this, this school year alone, the school district you know, received $527,000 of extra funding and in the 24-25 school year, we'll be you know, receiving an estimated 980,000 additional funding. I'm asking the school to speak about it tonight during tonight's agenda. Hopefully you guys can make some clarity to what that extra funding was for and why it hasn't been mentioned in any of the presentations that have been presented to the public. Appreciate it, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks. We'll make a note of that at the end of the note. So anybody else in the audience would like to be recognized at this time? All right, thank you. We're gonna move on to good news. We're going to have our activities director, Andrew Caudill, and we have special guests coming for an update on our winter athletics and activities. All right. So we have uh, three teams that are going to uh, come forward and give a season recap. We're going to go ahead and start with uh, wrestling and our head coach, Ian Rubel. And he has a guest with him, Miss Charlotte.
Good evening, good evening, good evening everybody. Um, so I'm Coach Rubel. Um, I have Charlotte Kellogg with me here. Um, she is one of um, Prescott's first female wrestlers. Um, it's a program that I'm kind of excited to get rolling. Um, the state of the sport of the sport of wrestling for girls in Wisconsin um, has doubled in the past year. Um, so it's something that I'm glad that we're part of. Um, it's something I want to continue growing and keep seeing in addition to our um, boys program boys program's growth. Um, so Charlotte's going to talk a little bit about what it means to wrestle for her and then I'll give you a quick recap of our season. <laughs> uh, well, it was my first year wrestling and uh, I learned a lot. Um, I got to do or I got to wrestle at a lot of our meets and I learned or I got to um, surround myself in a good community and uh, I really enjoyed wrestling and I want to do it or continue to do it for the rest of high school. Cool. Thank you. Congrats. <laughs> um, so I guess as a, I just this a little taller, sorry. The tall guys coming next. Um, so um, as a program, um, we were, unfortunately we were 0-6 um, in our conference, um, which um, sounds pretty bad on paper until you realize that um, our conference won um, four of the 14 state individual titles. Um, so the middle border, as we'll hear two other times tonight, um, is extremely tough to compete in, in all sports. Um, and so, you know, in, in a program that is um, kind of fledgling, um, you know, it, you, you're gonna take your lumps. Um, but it doesn't mean we, you know, we're bad. Um, success is measured as, you know, um, achieving a purpose or an aim, um, not necessarily wins and losses. Um, and we definitely saw a lot of successes. Um, a lot of our kids didn't know what wrestling was, didn't know what a right leg lead was or a left leg lead, um, didn't know a single leg, double leg. And um, at the end of the year, I'm confident that, um, you know, most of our kids could probably give anybody in this room a quick little five minute lesson in, in what wrestling is. <laughs> um, you know, and just seeing our kids come together, um, you know, we started with a, quite a widespread of kids. We did, you know, athletes like Nolan Tomley, um, and then we had athletes like um, Colton Perry, and we had our girls like Charlotte. Um, and it's a wide versa group, it's a wide group. Um, and at the end, you know, um, we spent a lot of time together. Um, wrestling puts you really close to your teammates, just given the nature of the sport. Um, and so we grew together um, and ultimately had a great time and we were, we were looking forward to next year. So, thanks. Thank you. Okay. All right, next up we'll bring up Owen Hamilton for girls basketball and his guests, Miss Violet and Miss Rory. Uh, my name is Owen Hamilton. I just wrapped up my second season as the girls uh, varsity basketball coach. I have Violet Otto, uh, first team all-conference sophomore up here with me, and Rory Zulsdorf, who is honorable mention this season as a junior. Um, this year we finished with a record of 16 and 10, and in my opinion was one of the hardest schedules in our conference, if not our entire state. Um, we lost in the regional final, unfortunately, to Somerset. Uh, overall, I think it was a successful year. Some of the highlights would include our trip down to Kenosha, which was right after Christmas, uh, where we fundraised money to go down and take a trip that not many teams in this area, I think AC, we were the first in our, first in our area to ever go down and play in this tournament. Um, we were able to play two teams that we'd never get the opportunity to play. They're both Division One, Division Two, really high enrollment schools. Um, it was a different style of play than we're used to, too. So we got to play against physical, really fast competition. Uh, we went one and one on the trip. Two great games, two down to the wire games. Um, in our first game, we unfortunately lost to Racine Park. After that, we beat Racine Case, thanks to Rory's 18.14 rebound performance, where she won crumble cookies for our team. So it was a really fun environment. Made the bus ride home fly by a little quicker. Um, 
Other than that, other highlights, Violet Otto finishing eighth in the Division three three-point shooting was one highlight. Uh, we finished the month of January seven and one. Uh, let's see, other than that, we had, like I said, Violet's first team all-conference, Lila Postuma was also first team all-conference, and Rory was honorable mention. Other notes is that Re Lila was recently named honorable mention to All-State. She's also our, broke our rebounding record this season with a record of 763, I believe. And then she became our 6,000 point scorer. So overall, I believe it was a good year, and I believe that the two girls up here are hungry for next season and looking forward to what's to come. All right, last but not least, boys basketball. We have Nick Johnson along with Mr. Mason and Mr. Dallas Wallen. Okay, yeah, Nick Johnson, this is my 13th year as a varsity basketball coach in town here. Um, we had a phenomenal season. We really did from top to bottom. We were 21 and seven. Uh, we were finished 12 and two in conference and just kind of like both coaches mentioned, our conference this year from, was every single night, if you didn't bring it, you were gonna get beat. And for us to go through that conference this year with, we had some injuries we dealt with. Um, it was a very successful season in our conference. Again, we came in the season, we weren't picked to win our conference. Some polls we were second, some polls we were third. We didn't get recognized in the state, we were not a top 10 team. And we kind of used that a lot this year as fuel uh, to motivate our kids even more, uh, to show the state, to show our conference that we were, we were very strong this year. And you know, the playoff run we went on, uh, was was one of the best that I've been a part of in my 13 years. You know, coming in, we end up beating Somerset for the third time. We beat Osseo in a regional final, who's kind of been our nemesis the last two years. They've knocked us out of playoffs the last two years before this season. We knocked them off regional finals. We beat Somerset for the third time. And then we take a GET team in the sectional finals. Uh, what many thought was a, a team that uh, couldn't be stopped offensively. We were a defense-minded team all season. We came in day one. Uh, we preached it. We preached it. And our kids executed everything to perfection, our game plans, and they worked so hard. You know, we've got a lot of people say, like, was such a fun team to watch because of how hard our kids worked. And I've told our kids, I've told our people, they've kind of, we've kind of reestablished our program being a defensive-minded team. And we've kind of stepped away the last few years with that. And now it's, um, what what these guys did before us and what our senior class and our team did this year, I mean, defense wins championships and it was proven this year. We go to state, we play St. Thomas Moore, the number one team preseason, number one team picked to win state, the number one team to end the season. Nobody gave us a chance. We went down there, we went toe to toe with them for 30 minutes. Um, and I couldn't be more proud of our group we had. Um, like I said, to go into that game, that team's got two Division I basketball players, a Division I baseball player, two Division III basketball players, uh, and we were in and out in a couple threes being knocked down where we had them on the ropes. But no reason not to be proud of our kids and what they accomplished this year. Uh, amazing things. And a couple of them right here. Uh, we'll start with Mason. Uh, he was a huge contributor for us. He did all the dirty work. He did everything we asked him to do. Uh, not too many teams get to a state uh, semi game with a 6 1 center. Um, but Mason played huge all year for us, and he was, he was so impactful on both ends of the floor. Um, Dallas, who recently last night was just named Arnold Mention All State. Um, obviously, I'm very biased, but Dallas was a first team All State player. It just didn't come out that way. But Dallas was phenomenal. Dallas in our history of Prescott, he was th he's third all time in scoring. He's first in rebounding and he's third in assist all time. And he has cemented himself as I told him this on, on the Mount Rushmore of Prescott basketball. He's a top four player we've ever had. You could argue he's the best player we've ever had. And his performances in the playoffs was, it, it was special. And I've told Dallas this many times, but four years I got to sit on the sidelines and watch him play and it was a treat every night. He, he, Phenomenal player, you know, he's gonna go on and do great things, but other people recognize our team, Kobe Russell's honorable mention, he was a sophomore, we're gonna be bringing him back for the next two years, and then Ian Lees, our other captain, he's both of our captains, he's on vacation or he would be up here too, but overall, again, couldn't be more proud of our kids and we had a great, great season, so that's basketball this year. Thanks, guys.
anything from the sites. <clears throat> Members of the board, Sandy Strand, Director of Student Services. My good news is that this is the time of the year where um, referrals to special education and special education assessments start to dwindle down. Um, and we're very grateful for that because our teachers have worked their tails off with an inordinate amount of uh, referrals at the elementary and early childhood level. Um, so we're just very happy. Thank you. Sarah Dusick, principal at Malone Elementary. I'm just here to give just a short little update on summer school registration. Um, it closed on the Friday before spring break. It's never actually really closed. If people wanted to still register, they could reach out and we would make sure we found spots for them. Um, but our first run at the numbers show that we um, have more students enrolled this year than we did last year at this time. And then another um, big addition to summer school this year is that um, Mrs. Magneto from the intermediate school and Ms. Seward, the K-5 music teacher, um, are co-directing um, a Finding Nemo play that's going to take place in the afternoons. They're going to do programming in the afternoons for the 15 days of summer school. Um, and 51 students are signed up for that. And that's um, K-6 programming. So it's going to give some of the little, little, little younger kids an opportunity to play lead roles in a performance that they don't get um, in those other musicals that are provided at the upper level. So we're excited for summer school programming this year. Speaking of musicals at the upper level, uh, this week is Tech Week for a musical, um, high school musical, the musical. Um, and this weekend they have shows Friday, Saturday, and we're hoping for Sunday. Um, this was the play that was canceled when COVID hit in 2020, so we're hoping it's not a cursed show. Um, but come out, bring family, friends. It should be really fun. Um, if, you're, if you've got uh, nostalgia for the late 90s or early 2000s, um, the kids been gathering from our staff and families uh, some vintage items and clothing to wear. So it should be a lot of fun for everyone to see. Thank you. The last thing I have uh, uh, for administration is just a huge thank you to our staff who have stayed uh, incredibly engaged. Um, we just came off of spring break. Um, we're working hard, and I wanted to thank the admin team for checking in and all the work that they've been doing uh, to support um, the work of our teachers and the academic learning for our students. <coughs> All right, we'll move on to business items here. First item is consent. In the consent, we have the February 21st regular board minutes, finance report, non-licensed personnel hires, resignation, retirements, employment change of non-licensed staff, CSI 11-24-25 agreement. And we'll move to item six is bridging brighter smiles, 24-25 school year, except NEOLA technical updates and changes, uh, version 33.1 for board policy per district administrator's responsibility, and that is it. And again, we moved out item five already. So, any other changes to the consent that we'd like to pull out before we adopt it? No. All right. I will approve the consent <coughs> agenda. Adopt the consent agenda as presented. Are there any objections? All right, the consent agenda is adopted. Thank you. We're going to move to item B, consider hires, resignations, terms, and employee changes of licensed staff. This time we have one resignation, Diana Karulik, who is our middle school choir director, uh, effective at the end of the year. Any questions or comments from the board? Right, we'll take a motion. Uh, I move to approve all licensed hires, retirees, and resignations as presented. I'll second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Item C is resolution authorizing the transfer of funds. The establishment of an escrow account with respect to a decent sub certain are of the general obligation of funding bonds dated July 13th, 2022. Yeah. 
So the resolution is posted. You have a copy of the resolution. You had Sue Gert as a finance director presented last month with myself. Um, this is the opportunity um, where uh, a year ago we were attempting to prepay this, uh, some of our bonds that were taken out in 2022. That was the most recent um, infrastructure. The interest rates for those bonds are at 4 and 5%. Um, we have the opportunity to prepay that those bonds that will save taxpayer um, for taxpayers that we would have to levy for that voter approved. Um, bond uh, over four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Get that oh. showing up on the screen. You'll see on the middle column. Unfortunately, the light uh, for people in here but at home will show up on the screen. <laughs> On the bottom right, what we're basically doing is um, using some additional funds that are in Fund 39. They only can be used to prepay bonds. Um, that presentation basically uh, will go into escrow, and you are having a resolution to make that effective at the end of March. It'll save, um, the basically they call it defeasance, it's like prepaying your mortgage. Um, and I'll lower our levy for future taxpayers by four hundred and fifty-two dollars for four hundred and fifty-two thousand. Uh Vicky, any questions on this? No. Ryan? Right. Um maybe just an understanding question. When you say it saves taxpayers four hundred and fifty two thousand dollars, stuff how how does that appear? How do taxpayers feel that? Or is it just really more money that's kind of levied that can go into other areas of the budget. Yeah, so um, this, since it's a voter approved bond, yeah. we are able to levy the community for that. Since we're paying down this, it basically is meaning that you'll be able to levy less money to pay over, for overall bonds. And so it's um, basically, it's why to some degree you have been able to save our taxpayers $1.5 million over the last uh, four years by prepaying bonds. Um, takes advantage, obviously, of the, um, trying to keep our uh, interest rates at the lowest levels. Great, thank you. Yeah, just I think reiterate, Rick, I think you already said this last week, we talked about it, it needs, these dollars need to stay in 39 too, right? So any savings, any, any anything stays in 39. Right, you can't use these dollars for anything other than um, paying for the principal and interest on an annual um, basis. Stuff. Um, when you have accrued money where you can take a lump sum. Yeah. Um, the next bond that will be paid off will be the work that you did on what is now the intermediate school at 125 Elm, and we'll be paying that bond off next March in 2025. So the savings we've talked about, right, stays in 39 and goes towards payoff of other debt service that we have. Or, in this case, we won't have to levy as much okay. like from the taxpayers okay. to pay off because it's going down. So thank you. Yeah, and just to reiterate, Fund 39 for those, that's the, that's the voter approved fund for capital maintenance, is that fair to say? Or, or for any bonds. For any bonds? Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, anything else before we move? All right, so can we just use this to... Yes, yeah, so okay. we did get clarification. Corals uh, is your legal um, uh, group, Corals and Brady, the bond council, um, basically said as long as you are referencing the um, resolution, it's shown and it's available to anybody that would like it. Um, you're just making uh, approval to set up this uh, funding uh, to be transferred in escrow to pay off your bond early. All right, so I'll take a motion. I move to approve defeasance resolution authorizing the transfer of funds, the establishment of an escrow account with respect to and the defeasance of certain of the general obligation funding bonds dated July 13, 2022, saving taxpayers $452,031. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that one carries. Thank you. Item D is the one we pulled out of consent. The early college credit program. We'll start college now. I'm going to have Principal Figgy 
from the high school come up. Good evening again. Um, I just, we, you know, we've worked for two years to get this in consent agenda, and I think the very first one we had in consent agenda, I had you guys pull it out. Um, I, I wanted to highlight a couple things um, that I think are kind of pertinent based on where we're at currently with our district and a number of Wisconsin districts are also experiencing um, with the need for funds. So um, you know that about six or seven years ago, this program was just starting up, they changed names. We um, in Prescott had one, two, maybe three students uh, term who were seeking out this program. And it's it's incrementally grown, and then since COVID, it has very swiftly grown. Um, when we had 12 students taking uh, courses at the college level per um, semester, that was a lot. And then this year, we started to see 20. Next year, we have 30 students seeking courses for the fall um, semester. And we will expect to see more taking courses or seeking to take courses for the spring semester. So it's really, really great that we've set up a program that allows students to get to that level of rigor and to explore all these areas that we can't currently offer. Um, I did want to highlight a couple of things, though. Um, I've been in touch with a number of other districts. The state of Wisconsin just released their funding numbers for last year. And the program has outgrown what they're able to fund and what they're allocating for funding. So the state of Wisconsin has pledged to fund 25% of the cost of this program and the district has to fund the other 75%. Last year, because they outgrew this, they pushed nine more percent onto local school districts to find the funding and didn't tell us until after the reimbursals were due to school districts. So I, I think it's just a really great example of great programming done by the state that is good for our kids, but comes with a lot of nuances that I don't know that our community um, and community members um, maybe understand because they're not firmly ensconced in state programs for education and, and funding. So, um, and Josh, just yep. for clarification, so last year the program outstripped the amount of funding that was available, so the bucket that was available more districts are grabbing into it, so we got less than 25% reimbursement. Correct. Is there any more money put in for the upcoming year? For this current year, there was no more money put in. We don't know what next year holds, and that's what we're applying for, but this year they didn't allocate any additional funds. And just so the community understands, our legislature is in um, spring break until January of 2025. So there will be no new money coming Correct. forward for programs like this, which is an excellent program, required, happy to do it, and I'm really proud of our uh, high school uh, staff to be able to elevate our students to this level, but it does show you how programs grow, but when funding doesn't, you have to take it from other areas. Yep. Um, quick, quick clarifier, sorry. Yep. Um, you mentioned the 25 and the 75 split. Yes. Is it 25 now after the 9% or is it now it's going to be 14? In, in yeah, so, so, so I, I probably said it a little confusing, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a confusing way. Um, we do get a discount from local universities. Mm -hmm. So they, we, they charge us 50% of the cost of, the, of a normal credit. We're responsible of that 50% for 75% of that cost, yep. and the state's supposed to cover the other 25%. Okay. The state came back and said, we're only gonna cover 91% of the 25% that we were originally going to give you. Okay. All right. um, one of the other questions I've gotten pretty often from um, community members that know about this program is, why don't you just tell, why don't you tell kids no? Like if we're, if we're in dire straits for money, why don't you just say no? And the state says you can't do that. That you're, you're obligated to give students the ability to take courses up to 18 credits um, for courses that satisfy graduation requirements that you don't currently offer. Um, we're required to put out information two times a year to families, letting them know they have this ability too. So again, it's really, really great, but I just want the community to know and the board to know the ins and outs that we'll start to see probably increasing costs for this. Um, I've been in touch with a number of other districts who are alarmed because they're bigger and they have a university in town mm -hmm. and they're not sure how they're going to be able to sustain this programming with the current funding that they're getting. So 18 is the number of credits that 
we're allowed to, and that's all we've ever done, right? We had once talked about expanding the number of credits, but we never have for board we policy, had, right? We've had, yes, we had like a student or two that was asking to exceed 18, and we said no. We said no, right, okay. And at this point, I don't, we, I start to, I've said no, I don't even bring you anybody yeah. who yeah. would violate the policy. Okay, yeah. Um, and I asked this last time, and you all assured me this was happening, but this is just another example of why registration and looking at the classes we offer is so important. So psychology was one of the big ones. I remember last time we talked about it, and so finding ways to offer that. So then kids don't take it at other places because they take it through us first, and then they might expand that learning someplace else. That's, yeah, that's correct. There's with like eight this year? With Yes, with, but with two caveats. The state has, because there were complaints, they used to say, as long as you offered comparable courses, they've now defined that to say you have to, the course has to have the same credentials, and 85% of the curriculum needs to be the same okay. as the college course. Okay. So every one of these courses needs to go through a curriculum review yeah. right. of what we currently yeah, so offer. This is the curriculum and, yeah. Correct. So Josh, just so I got it straight, the, it's a mandated program, state mandates it, but they're not funding it, right? It's I mean, it's special, not even, they're funding 25%, 91% of the They're funding less than, right. less than what they so pledged, they're yes. Basically telling us we, gotta, we have to support this, we can't, we have no choice. To turn students down. Right? Correct. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. But they're not giving us any additional dollars. And yeah. 18 is the number of credits. Okay. That 18 we, is state the, statute. Okay. Yes. Right. We can't go below that. Okay. Okay. Reminded, I think it's a great program. I oh, want to, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Right. And just as a reminder, there's a surplus also at the state level, but they're still reducing the funding for this. Okay. Um, I think we all agree, though. I heard everybody say it. This is a great program. It's something that we're super proud of. It's amazing that we have so many students that are able to access this and be successful within this um, college programming. We're proud of that. It's just, you're right, right. it's a good awareness to the community that this costs, this costs us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and, more, and it's worth investing in our kids, so it's worth it, but yep. <laughs> it's a cost. Okay, so I think we need a motion to approve the E, the ECCP and the start college and application for fall semester 2024-25. So right? Correct. <coughs> Mike, I got a clarification. Since it's, we have to approve it, it's, I just I just want to be clear. I mean, we have no choice but to approve it, right? I mean, it's state statute. Mm -hmm. Our policy lines of statute. Yeah. There's there's no choice. <coughs> but is that is that correct? The, the only thing that could be, the only reasons for denying it is if you believe that we offer courses that are comparable, yeah. or if the student didn't meet the deadline to get the applications to us, which was March 1st. And sure. Did. And, and so I, what I just heard is they all did, and, and we believe that everyone who's applied for a course, um, rightfully so, right? We can't, we can't, we don't currently offer those, so, all right. Thanks. I just, yeah. It does seem like a weird thing to approve when you can't. It's a weird thing to approve. But, uh, but. I mean, <laughs> that's why. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we need a motion. You got to make one up here. Um, Let's go back up to consent. Yeah. Read that. Um, I move to approve the ECCP Start College Now applications for fall semester 24 25 school year. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That uh, carries. Thank you. Item E is proposed employee handbook addendum regarding retirement notice after February 1st, contained <laughs> on April 2nd, 2024 referendum vote. Very specific. Yeah. Um, we presented this last month. Um, this comes out of obviously the situation that we're in. By statute, teachers are. Um, licensed staff need to be notified by April 30th that they have a contract or not being renewed. Um, we had obviously in our handbook uh, in order for us to make sure that retirees are set up with the Wisconsin retirement system as well as to be able to post and recruit the best and highly qualified in time. Um, we have a February 1st retirement deadline that allows us to set up the paperwork for retirement, also to post positions and then also to get, uh, do the paperwork for any post-retirement benefits. 
Obviously, with uh, the potential of um, having to cut an additional $1.2 million from the budget, some of our staff uh, came forward and said they're not ready to retire, but in a very selfless way offered that um, they would rather preserve a younger staff member than um, stay, but they wanted to make sure that they didn't lose any of their benefits. We talked about this. I think um, the teachers that came forward, it was very beneficial. Um, and we even clarified um, that um, they would, res um, if they were basically, um, if it was not to pass the referendum on April 2nd, they could submit their um, retirement and then they would retain all eligibility. So we're just coming back with that. Um, well, Bradley, as we mentioned last month, um, did put in that if somebody were to retire from us, um, and some of our staff members do have um, post-retirement health benefits, that if they took a job and benefits were available, they were required to take it and notify us. Um, the administration um, and the staff that we work with both support it and uh, would hope that the board would uh, allow this one-year hardship waiver. Tanya, any questions, comments? Uh, no, no questions, comments wise. I, I thought it was just, um, it, it was just really good communication. Our staff came to us. They used an opportunity to speak to us. We were able to talk about it. Um, and I think this really does speak to um, just kind of the, the staff members that we have, the kind of the ethics and the mor morality of, of some of our staff that just really believe in um, preserving some of our younger staff and careers and doing what's best for the district. And I think um, this, is, this was a great idea. We did not think of it. And um, yeah, we're thankful. Yeah. Uh, I have nothing more to add, no time, no additional questions. Thank you. No, I, I agree with time. Uh, yeah, we're good. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. that staff that brought this to our attention and it's a it's a great addition to the handbook for this this year so uh, we can entertain a motion i move to approve adding a one-year hardship contingency regarding retirement notice to the employee handbook as presented i'll second motion and a second all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed that carries item f is boys golf overnight trip All right, good evening. Um, here to get an overnight trip approved for boys golf happening this season. That kind of falls in line with what we do with our teams, giving them opportunities that present themselves to go play in great events, and one presented itself for boys golf. Uh, the event is on April 19th in Reedsburg. They would travel there on the 18th after their event in Hastings and return home after the event is over on the 19th. The trip is being funded by the Parent Booster Club. That would be the housing and the food. Uh, the district budget for boys golf would cover the gas uh, to get there and home, which is going to be about $75 to, to $85 in the district vehicle provided by um, the transportation department. And that's pretty much it. Uh, Pat, you got anything for this one? Questions, comments? Oh, well, covered it. Yeah. Um, real quick, we said the transportation provider of the transportation department. Yep. Is this a bus or is this the? It's a vehicle. It's just the the suburban. Okay. Okay. It's a varsity event, so that would be five students and I believe two coaches. Okay. Uh, Tiny. Uh, no, I, this is uh, speaks. We just had three great coaches up here talking about their schedule and how some of these more challenging events really help set them up for success down the road and um, it's a great example for what um, opportunities we're giving for our boys in this case. I just was going to ask how many kids and you said five golfers and two coaches so thanks. All right thanks Andrew. I'll take a motion. Uh, I move to approve the, boy, uh, the boys golf overnight trip to Reedsburg, Wisconsin. I'll second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That one carries. And we'll mm -hmm. on to our last item, the sponsorship <coughs> for softball video board. Yeah, so um, opportunity for a, a tier two sponsorship founding sponsor for um, Hastings Chrysler and Hastings Ford for the gym and the softball field. All right, Vicki, any questions or comments here? Um, 
I don't, I guess I don't know that I have a whole lot of questions, just kind of a comment with this being new and I think these requests probably coming forward more often, especially now that we're going to add the softball board. Um, I guess would this be one of those items that we could eventually move into consent instead of having to have a presentation every time we have a a request? Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's a that's a great question, and I would kind of flip it back to you. there's already guidelines to who we allow to sponsor. I assume they have to kind of meet like our standards, as in you know things appropriate for high school kids, and you know, and you vet all those through through you. And if there was any question or concern, it might be a good time to be brought back up. But otherwise, um, just wanted to verify that it's kind of a vetting process. Yeah, there's already board policy that covers who is allowed and who isn't. And then we have policy on what contrast can look like and contrast that be approved by the board it can be consent or business. So. I agree, Vicki, consent sounds great. Yeah. No, no other comments. Maybe, you know, thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to Andrew and the district for making sure that um, uh, there's some clarity for all of our sponsors who want to do great things for the district and an understanding of, of the different levels they're at and what that means. So um, I know that uh, I know that our policies uh, were followed. We've had a discussion about that. So um, uh, no no additional questions for me on this. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. We're good. I uh, we just need a motion. Um, I, can, I can do it. Um, I move to approve a sponsorship. Uh, as for hasty, <coughs> sorry, there's writing. <laughs> um, let's see. So I still can't see it, but oh, I got it. Okay, I move to approve sponsorship for Hastings Ford and Hastings Chrysler as a bundled sponsorship for the uh, PH Gym and Varsity Girls video boards for five years. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That uh, carries. Thank you. And that concludes business. Now we move on to information discussion. First item is update on Office of Civil Rights Report and Non-Discrimination. So Sandy Strand will be coming forward and walking us through. These are two different reports and an incredible <coughs> amount of detail and reporting that's required. I just want to thank her the administrative team and the admin assistants that worked tirelessly on this. Uh, the dates got moved multiple times because the federal and state uh, repositories weren't able to handle some of the updates. So Sandy, thank you for your patience and walk us through. All right, so um, like Dr. Spacuza mentioned, every five years, um, school districts are required to um, review our um, data under school board policy um, and under Wisconsin State Statute 118.13 and Administrative Rule 9.06. Um, and as part of that five-year review, if you go on to the next slide, um, we have to consider all of the following. Um, the report that um, will be published to the website um, includes um, an introduction of the purpose of the report, um, who participated in the review of the data, um, uh, and then the areas that we reviewed were data around creating a healthy school culture for students and staff, school board policies and administrative procedures, ensuring that we have active um, and current school board policies and procedures on all of these things, demographics and enrollment trends in classes and programs, participation trends, um, and patterns and school district supports um, athletics, extracurricular and recreation, methods, practices, curriculum and materials used in instruction, counseling and pupil assessment and testing, trends and patterns of discipline act, disciplinary actions including suspension, expulsion and handling of pupil harassment and then a brief conclusion and recommendation. So I've just kind of really um, briefly um, 
kind of summarized each of the sections. Um, these were the individuals that um, had access to the report and reviewed the report and provided um, feedback. Um, really, it's it's just straight up data. So um, what we do is we look at the, the data and um, what we did for the healthy school culture is we reviewed the staff culture surveys that were reviewed um, over the course of the past five years. Um, and overall, according to those staff culture surveys, um, we definitely are a high performing district in terms of staff perception. A large majority of people um, report that they like their jobs and they enjoy coming to work every day. Um, when asked how likely staff would be to recommend Prescott as a place to work um, between 2020 and 2021 and then the 22-23 school year, um, our staff rating grew from 63% of staff would recommend Prescott as a place to work to 76% of staff in the 2022-2023 school year would recommend Prescott as a place to work. Um, also, um, we every two years we administer the youth risk behavior survey I have um, presented in the fall on what the results of those were it previously um, and what we found in the past three years the survey um, did indicate um, uh, let me see I'm trying to read the the slide um, oh, based, based on the, the um, results of the survey, we did find um, higher incidences of students um, around substance use, around thoughts of depression, um, death or suicide, and as such, we, coming out of COVID really, and as such, we did, um, as a district, go ahead and increase our mental health co-located services and um, added a tier two intervention at the secondary level by way of Empower You. Um, we also have done zones of regulation training in our elementary, and as a result of those interventions, we have seen a decrease in the referrals to our co-located services over time. Um, when we talk about our demographic and enrollment trends in academics and co-curriculars, um, let's see, uh, the Prescott School District's enrollment, we know, um, has gone from 1,243 12, pupils down to, I think, 1,320 um, to in uh, the, the last year. Approximately half of the students enrolled um, are male and the other half are female. Um, over the course of the past five years, we have increased the proportion of student, students of varying demographics, participating in advanced courses, dual enrollment, um, industry-recognized coursework, and work-based uh, learning opportunities. Um, we also have a high percentage, as you heard from um, Mr. Figge, uh, a high percentage of students who participate in um, other um, activities, advanced courses, uh, but also in theater, arts, dance, design, um, <coughs> and those types of activities. We go on to the next slide. Um, and then uh, during the 2019 and 2020 school year, and obviously the 2020-2021 school year, our enrollment rates did drop in some of our school-sponsored athletic programs due to the pandemic. Um, but the next slide, I believe, um, gives a brief breakdown um, uh, from 2020, 2021, and 2022 as of, um, as of the time of this review, we didn't have current data for um, all of 2023. So uh, these are the sports that we um, support um, through PCR. And you can see that in um, 2020, we had about f almost 400 girls participating and about 243 boys. And between over the course of those three years, that number's kind of flipped. Um, so that's somewhat interesting information um, to me. But um, so we just have to keep an eye on those trends and make sure that our girls and our boys are accessing opportunities on an equitable basis. Next slide, please. Um, when we talk about our methods, practices, curriculum, and materials used in instruction, counseling, and pupil assessment and testing, um, what we know and what you've heard from um, Mr. Kosmalski over the course of the year when it comes to our state report card and our um, student achievement um, being in the top 10 in the state and um, uh, top performing district in the Middle Border Conference. What we know is that our collaboration Mondays, the time that our teacher 
researchers spend on those Mondays reviewing data, both benchmarking and progress monitoring data at all levels, our winter and summer data digs, um, where we actually look at the whole school data as well as individualized data, and the use of our reading and math interventionists. We know that that has dramatically improved our performance um, so that we are, again, the top 10% academically in the state, top three among elementary schools in the state. We've gained approximately 17 percentile points at our middle school, um, up to 68th percentile proficient. And at the high school, the number of AP students and credits earned has increased significantly as well as you just heard. Um, when we talk about um, incidences uh, or patterns of disciplinary action, including suspension, expulsion, and handling of pupil harassment, I did, um, for the purpose of this report, I did just a straight up um, numerical report. Um, so you can see over the course of time, um, our suspensions have um, really gone down, our use of suspension, and we very rarely use expulsion um, as a um, means to an end when we're um, looking at disciplinary action. Uh, it's very rare. Um, any reports of harassment during the course of the past five years have been resolved informally, um, with exception of two formal Title IX investigations that have occurred during that time period. And generally, the allegations of harassment with those um, reports are not related to protected class. So the next slide um, talks about, this is actually the conclusions and recommendation that were placed in the report. Um, we know that Prescott continues to be dedicated to prov providing high quality, comprehensive supports and academics, athletics, extracurriculars, and the arts. Um, we know that we are dedicated to helping our secondary students in pursuing scholarships, awards, post-secondary education, and opportunities, and opportunities to save money on post-high school credits. Um, our multifaceted approach ensures that all students, regardless of their demographic identification, have access to resources. Um, I do recommend moving forward that when we do our staff perception questionnaire that we try to maintain over the course of a data collection period the same questions. Um, that was one of the issues that I had early on. Um, we had different questions on the staff perception questionnaire than we did um, in later years. So just making sure that that's streamlined. And then also um, the district needs to continue to work on equitable practices, ensuring that every child has the opportunity to access high quality education, resources, scholarships, and can participate in extracurricular activities. Um, so when we talk about the civil rights data report, this is like, this is like data on steroids. Um, so it's all of the information that I just shared with you, but then it's broken down by de um, racial demographic. And it's the federally identified race categories. Um, so I, I was able to data mine, thanks to Susie Linder. Um, really, Susie Linder is a god um, when it comes to data mining in Infinite Campus. Um, and I know that this is recorded for um, perpetuity, so um, Susie, just know that you are amazing. Um, the federal report asks for information on students, schools, and programs involving students served in non-local education agency facilities. So if we have a student placed in a residential facility or if we placed a student at St. Joe's or something like that. And we also look at the early childhood indicators, including preschool. So we don't technically run a preschool program, but we run a special ed program for three-year-olds. So so we have to report demographics from age three all the way up through age 21. Um, we have to verify that the policies um, uh, outlined um, in the five-year non-discrim report exist, so there's some overlap. Um, we consider harassment based on protected class, so that was how I was able to discern um, when we look at our um, harassment uh, documentation in Infinite Campus, almost all reports of harassment um, did not pertain to protected class. Um, we look at data around distance education and GED for all race classes and disability status and male-female status. So it really is a fun exercise in data mining. And, um, and that is that is it. So that report was submitted prior to the deadline. Um, and the five-year non-discrim report does not actually get submitted to DPI. Um, but uh, an assurance has been submitted on behalf of the district and that report remains in our possession.
Any questions? Vicki, you have any questions or comments? No, that was a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. It's a lot of information. Yeah, so it's every five years, so... Every five years okay. is the non-discrim, and it's every two years for the civil rights. Okay. And the civil rights is a federal report. I was going to say, that one's the federal. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well... Wow. So yeah, if there's some way to streamline a couple of those, right? So then, for sure, <laughs> exactly, exactly. That. No questions. Thank you. Yeah, no right. problem. Uh, I don't necessarily have questions, but a couple of noticings that I thought you brought up to um, PCR. I, I was just hoping that that's a conversation with our PCR director. I do get worried about that girl boy flip because mm -hmm. it's almost, I noticed that right away too. It was a flip, which is just, you know, how do we make sure our girls are staying involved and stuff? Mm -hmm. um, her staff perception, I was so excited to see that grew and it grew quite a bit. And when I looked back the first year that we had that data, it was 2021. That was probably like the year kids were starting to come back, come back from, COVID. from COVID, as well as teachers. I mean, that was, <laughs> as an educator, I remember that as being one of the most challenging years I've ever had in education. Mm -hmm. The year that we came back was really hard. Um, and then uh, Collaboration Mondays, I think that went into place the 21-22 school year. Mm -hmm. And then that 22-23, that's when we saw that really big it grow. So it's really um, told me, or you know, without having all of the ins and outs of the school district, like being in there talking to people, but it looked to me like people settled back in, kind of regained mm -hmm. kind of the comfort of being back in school. But also things like Collaboration Monday have really impacted um, people's just perception of being able to do their job and all the things that add to it and that connection piece. So it really, see that. it really has, um, Tanya, and I think it's I think it's great that you bring that up because a practice that was in place um, prior to the pandemic um, and uh, kind of had to go by the wayside because you know people weren't necessarily all together and um, was that mid year data dig and um, so we just kind of wrapped those up in January and February across all four sites and that's really good that's a really good time because um, they the teams have their collaboration Monday to kind of go through all that data organize it and then they actually present it to um, our superintendent myself and our director of teaching and learning and then we plan forward looking to the end of the school year so if we see a dip in the data mid-year we're able to then go okay so what are the steps we can take to get the kids ready for the forward testing in the spring and and so all of that time that we have available to look at that data as teams um, is really, really valuable. And it wouldn't happen if we didn't have right, that time. Mm -hmm. um, and then my last just kind of noticing was about our suspension rates. And I think it speaks to the data. And Michael does a great job bringing us the data as well. Um, but that 2019-2020 school year, really are probably you know one of our higher suspensions. Um, that was right during that COVID period. Yep. And then um, I we brought that back as a group and talked about that stuff. And we talked about adding interventionists. We started with the co-located services, at increasing that, I think, maybe a year or two later. And it's really nice to see how that data um, and those kind of interventions that are as traditional as a math intervention or reading intervention has um, helped with um, the social emotional being of our students. So yeah, good. and that continues to be a conversation with the administration, especially at the secondary level, of how can we really beef up our tier one and tier two in terms of behavioral support and social emotional learning. And I and I want to add like those are when we talk about what programming do we want to continue to support in our school district. Those are those extra pieces. Mm -hmm that we don't, we don't have to do, we're not required to do, but yet we know like that's what increases learning. Yeah. So collaboration time, um, how do we attack interventions, suspensions, I know we moved like our activities director outside of a position so we could add D. Um, so there's a lot of things that have happened that um, we find very valuable to stay in place and as part of the programming mm -hmm. that we're asking our community to support. Absolutely. And then my last thing is just to keep encouraging um, the harassment. Great, super great to hear that <coughs> protected classes. And I just always wonder about underreporting and encourage people Absolutely. to report things and things happen because we want it to get better. So, yeah. yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Awesome. Yep. The only thing I'll add is. I know. I think we had this report and me and you did back in I don't know, November. You were like, say. what? No, but it was it's it was very uh, very thorough. So what you put into the 10, 12, 13 slides here, 
um, is, is just a, it's, it's a great overview, but I know there's a lot more work put into it. <laughs> I can't imagine how many hours. I don't even, I, I, I dare to even ask you how many hours you put I in. I love this. it. This is my favorite wow. part of my job. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but if anybody wants to re read this, the whole thing it is, uh, it'll be posted right along the website. Yeah. Okay. It's, inter it's inter interesting information, actually. All right, we're going to move on and item B, update on logistics for current infrastructure referendum and summer 2024 projects. Yes, so over spring break, some of the community might have seen as you were driving by the middle school at 1220 St. Croix. Um, additional work was done on the brickwork. Um, last board meeting, we approved um, the redesign and removal of the brick that is um, separated from the wall over the parking lot and overhang. Um, that is going to be moving forward. The metal framing around the mezzanines to um, finally uh, secure those from water infiltration. Um, the metal panels were installed. Um, we are hoping that the tsunami that's supposedly about to hit us tomorrow night or over the weekend um, will give it a good test and we can now start to use that space. Um, all the asbestos and radon testing has been completed. Thank you to my Koika. Rick, really quick, the space you're talking about is, is what? Um, so the mezzanines are in uh, the front of, uh, to the left of door one, uh, the middle school and in the back. Um, they over, they house the um, air handler units, but also the wrestling room. And so that is space that has been unable to be used and also damaging uh, some new uh, electrical work that had been in there. So we're happy that that's uh, been completed. Um, we then also, uh, Mike Hoika uh, and our finance director, um, uh, River Valley Architects and Market and Johnson were able to complete um, the conference call. Uh, two of the um, items that we talked about, the varsity and the brickwork, will be moving forward. Um, they are finalizing the bids for Malone Elementary, but it fits within the parameters for the board and the residual money. Um, the residual money comes from the middle school locker room plumbing and showers not being done some of the additional um, interest that's been earned since June of 22. And this allows us to secure um, Malone Elementary in a better way. Uh, the vestibule now is double fob, and we'll have an office that's right at the beginning of the building. Um, making it more efficient for the staff, and also the nursing room will be moving forward. Um, that'll be all within budget, and um, Mike Koika also worked with the roofing, um, all of the Work is uh, being scheduled now for Malone Elementary and the middle school to start early in June. The windows will be removed early in June in, uh, uh, over at the elementary. And the reason I mention that is that those are the two oldest buildings and also two of the most um, cumbersome um, tasks. And that will then, by the end of June, tell us whether or not any of the contingency dollars, if something were to be a surprise, will have to be used, or if that also can be funneled into projects. Remember, all of this money is basically for capital and infrastructure, and so by the end of June uh, 2024, if we're able to move forward, then some of the things that we talked about, middle school lockers for girls and boys and the bleachers would be, um, we would move forward on those. Um, so I'm very happy to report that we're on time um, setting up with the schedules and all of the uh, boilers that are going to be um, constructed on site have been sized and we're very happy that the contractors came in over spring break to start the prep work for the summer. Pat, do you have any questions, comments? No, more, <clears throat> more of a comment. Uh, it's, um, I appreciate the approach and the process and, and then again, I don't always want to speak for Vicki here, but um, the work of the facilities committee, I, I feel kind of you know, validated that the, the projects we're going after, additional funds meet the criteria that was discussed and, um, and the importance. And the ones that, if funds are available, that we'll be able to, you know, some of the nice to haves, um, if we're lucky, we'll get to it, but if not, we're taking care of priority issues, so. Vicki? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm super happy that we are able to move forward with the Malone. I think that's something just from the aspect of having little kids in that building to be able to have that more secure um, 
entrance, more accountability for people coming in and out of that building and to make it a lot easier on the staff. I'm super happy about that. So that's it's good to know that that's moving forward. And I drove by in Campbell one day and I went, what looks different over at the school? And I'm like, ooh, the panels are up. And so it looks really nice on the mezzanine. <laughs> I'm excited to see what the, the rest of the building, I think, will look really, really nice. So, very exciting. Can I have no additional questions. I'll just reiterate, Rick. So, these are dollars from the 2022 facilities referendum that was passed. Correct. That because the project is coming in on budget in combination with interest rate, um, interest gained on the account from the bonds. We were able to knock off some of these some of these projects that um, weren't originally part of the RFP or whatever you want to call it the the list that we uh, the, the original list that we started with, right? Yeah. Yep. And so those dollars are, are coming out of the referendum dollars, not out of our fund not out of, not out of our uh, our fund balance or fund ten, not out of a fund forty six, which is our capital maintenance uh, funds, which. I find as a huge win because we have these projects on the list for Fund 46 dollars. Mm -hmm. the, the track, um, not necessarily the, the waterproofing, but the track was on there, um, and some of this other, some of this other stuff, the bleachers, some of these other projects that they're on, they're on the list to try to accomplish with Fund 46 dollars. Well, because the project is, is going so well. Um, we're able to do some of these other big ticket items. I think that's, that's a huge win for the district. And I think a huge win for the community, right? Um, these are, the mechanical things are, and the roofs are kind of 15 to 20 year generational investments um, to be able to upgrade those. Um, it's a huge thank you to our community, but it also then sets up the district for success moving forward. Yeah, so it's, it's a good story. And can you just like, in a sentence or two, the, the relationship with Market and Johnson, this is our first time working with them. How do you think it's been going over the last couple of years working with them? Uh, from our perspective, they've been very uh, responsive um, and uh, very helpful. I think that as we, I do want to just say that this summer, it will be equally, um, probably even more work that will be happening. Um, which is hard to believe given how uh, hectic it was. So um, I, what I would say is they've been responsive, very responsive to myself and to Mike Koika, um, as well as in preparation. So one of the things that I would say is preparation is probably 90% of the um, logistics and making sure that we execute um, flawlessly over the summer, a very short, tight window, um, and that they were here over spring break with vendors doing measurements for both the deconstruction and reconstruction of the boilers. I mean, these are heavy units. Um, uh, I just was impressed. And I'm, I'm, uh, right now, we'll just say that we have an excellent communication and working relationship with them and with uh, River Valley Architects. Awesome. All right, anything else on this one? We're going to move on and see the update on operating referendum for 1.2 million. Yes. Um, I am here, if you remember, uh, last month, it, it seems so long ago when you think of all the athletics, people going to um, championship games, going to the state, that we actually had a town hall meeting. Um, we had Baird Financial that came in. Um, we had Elise Mern and uh, Sue Gertis presented to you kind of our overall financial picture, not only a financial picture, but understanding how dollars come in. Um, wanted to share with everybody that we have information that we have our second and last uh, community meeting. It is this uh, coming Sunday on the 24th. It is just before, so it's a double feature. If you're interested in theater, you can be here at 2 o'clock. If you're interested in finances and theater, you can be here at 1230. So at 1230 this Sunday, we will have um, tables and presentations. Uh, in order to answer any questions that people have about state funding, how uh, frequently asked questions, we'll have a financial table, a program table, and school board members available to uh, meet and um, answer any questions. I did want to share that um, on the website, if you go below the banner, on the right-hand side, there's a pencil. The pencil takes you to the referendum page. 
The referendum page is there so that people can get facts. They can get the information unbiased with regards to external agencies as well as to the district <coughs> on how we are, um, how we've operated, steps that we've taken. Oh, there we go. It went black for a second. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that people understood that as you scroll down on the right hand side, if you were unable to be at the Baird presentation, you can see the whole presentation. Um, there was a very good write-up in the Pierce County Journal. Um, I was able to look at it. It uh, basically describes um, what an operational referendum is, how it's specific to the operations. So we're talking about utilities, busing, food service, salaries. We're talking about people and programs. Um, in addition, uh, there was information that people talked about with regards to kind of um, understanding how not every district in the state of Wisconsin, over 421 districts, receives the same amount of per pupil aid. In fact, Prescott Public Schools receives below the state average on per pupil aid. So we've done amazing things, top 10 in academics, top 15% in growth, and yet we are very fiscally conservative, we have been very fiscally prudent, and we have been generating excellent <coughs> results. You also know on April 2nd, we're coming back to our community to ask for a local investment of $1.2 million. And I'm gonna walk through and kind of remind people how we're here, how we got here, and why it's a two-pronged approach in trying to make sure that the Prescott Public Schools can still deliver on vibrant and um, kind of um, what I would say is programming that is vast opportunities for our students and viable for the long term. So you heard great things about our high school, but every school and program has been flourishing and we'll walk through that. Um, just know that in addition we have um, put information on the website with regards to the Wisconsin uh, School Board, uh, sorry, Wisconsin uh, Business Office has a three minute video and we've shared that. And one of the things that's important for people to understand is just the different buckets and how the money is designated for certain funds, can only be used for those funds, and how that plays out. And if you have been listening to us for the last three years as we came out of COVID, the additional expenses that we have because of COVID, and then obviously inflation, just like everybody else, and um, was reviewing a presentation that uh, Mr. Piggy put forward that is remindful of two things. One, we have a great program with early college. It's mandated. The costs increase for a district because we have more participation and we've done a good job preparing our students. The state, however, has not stepped up with creating additional funding. And so when you have fixed funding and more ass, that funding goes down. It is the same thing that happened in special education. More dollars were allocated for all districts in special education. That is true, but it was fixed for the next two years and special education population has increased over time. That means that when it's fixed and there's legislature is not coming back to 2025, we are gonna be receiving less money next year in special education reimbursement. Fund 10 currently spends $1.8 million to make sure that special education staffing, small class sizes, and the um, kind of uh, OT, PT um, interventionists are available to those students, rightly so, but it is uh, underfunded across the state and federal. Over 91 districts will be asking for additional money from their local communities. And so it is an investment. It's not coming from Madison at this time. Um, and so when it's not coming from Madison, our students don't have the time to wait and to miss out on opportunities. And that is why we're coming back to the community to ask about what are your values? What do you want at the cornerstone of our community? And if you have strong public schools, you have strong communities, and strong communities tend to invest in their schools. So with that, I just wanted to share that we will talk about what you have already instructed the administration, steps that we've taken to reduce budgets now 
based on the shortfall and ensure that we have $650,000 worth of cuts by fall of 2024. Understanding that we still require in order to have a balanced budget and to be able to be vi viable next year and into the future, we are asking for 1.2 local tax money to come in. That 1.2, if it is not supported, that would trigger an immediate need to make reductions. And the only places that we can make reductions in a service organization is in programs, in the people that run those programs, and in pay. And so if you want to be able to recruit and be competitive, you understand that 91 other districts are asking. A neighbor has already asked, River Falls, they received $1 million additional money from their community, $2 million, million the next year, and $3 million the next year. Ours is flat. They asked for one, two, and three, and for it to be recurring. So understand that we are, there are needs and there are wants. We were specifically conservative with regards to the ask, and I'll share with that how we came to that information. In addition, on the website, you'll see we have information both on the mill rate historically and where it would um, increase to. It is an increase this time. We are not keeping taxes flat. And so it is a, obviously a decision that people have to weigh on what the cost uh, benefit is for them. We are 12, 12 days away uh, with regards to when that vote occurs. And um, again, information from Baird and ourselves. So with that, I'll transition into kind of the final presentation that we have um, for our community other than um, Sunday the 24th at 1230 um, prior to the last performance for our students. We really wanted to make sure that people understood what is at stake. And we've talked about things that we've done to date, but this is really the, the picture that tells a thousand stories. And that is a thousand stories of every student, every staff member, and the employees, and also <coughs> our community. Three lines I want you to attend to. First is the horizontal line off the, um, I almost forgot, is it the x-axis? Oh, oh boy. it's been a while, right? There. All right? So on zero, right? So what we have is a dotted red line at the top, and that is our fund balance. And our fund balance is necessary because funding for public schools comes in incrementally across time. In fact, you have to book your revenue, all the state aid, all the federal aid, at the beginning of the year as we're building our budget. We do not receive 100% of those dollars. In fact, we have received less than 50% of the dollars up to this time. And the last payment is arriving in August, okay? Secondly, per month, we spend $1.2 million just in payroll. And so the board has a policy to make sure that if there was a government shutdown, is that in the news? Absolutely. If federal or state were to have shutdowns, if we weren't receiving any payments, we wanted to make sure that we could continue to function and operate, purchase things, run and pay utilities for up to three or four months. You take 1.2 million times three or four months, you can quickly see that's just a portion of what we pay. Obviously, personnel and payroll is a majority of it. So that dotted line has been identified as what is required based on your school board policy to be a viable fund balance to make sure that we can keep the lights on, we can keep staff paid, and to be able to operate. We do know that we are currently expending $900,000 more than we are receiving in revenue this year. That is the red line that is dropping from a fund balance of $5.8 million, and by the year 27-28, we would be crossing the threshold of being insolvent, no additional money, unable to execute the Prescott Public Schools system. Now that is unless additional steps are being taken. The additional steps being taken, we already knew that we had to reduce and tighten our belt. The school board made that as an intentional and strategic choice to take this year, get input from our staff, to get input from the community, and to present that numerous times to you over the last six months to start talking about how we would, one, make a reduction, and if we were going to ask our community to invest 
understanding how much, why, and for how long. And so I do want to make sure that people understand on the bottom, you see blue hash marks between 25 and 2027. That is the next biennium. The legislature does not gavel back in until January 2025. So we have no idea whether or not we will have additional funding. Know that the previous six years, prior to the last funding cycle, we got zero increase per pupil. The only way districts get more money is when per pupil in, is increased. And that goes back to that there is a levy cap. The districts cannot receive any additional money other than the per pupil. When you see more money coming from the state, it just means that it's lowering the local taxpayer um, payment. It's not increasing the overall money that a district receives. Understood, we did get $325 additional, but we do have decrease in enrollment. And so that is something of a push for us economically. People ask why when you have decrease in enrollment, are you unable to decrease your expenses? And if you saw a great um, video that Michael Kozmowski shared with me, think of a household of four. You have your oldest child going off to college. When that student leaves on a family of four, does your overall home expense decrease by 25%? And it doesn't because you still have a mortgage, you still have utility costs, you still have food, you still are making sure that you have insurance on that house, that you have health care for your family. And so when you have four people in a household and one student or child leaves the nest, you don't see a decrease of 25% in expenses. The same thing has happened for the Prescott Public Schools. We have seen a decrease of 65 students over the last five years. That decrease takes 65 times 325, right? It starts to add up. And so those are decreases, but we didn't diminish the square footage. We didn't diminish the need to heat, light, and uh, make sure that the buildings are cool. We did not decrease our program. We did not decrease staff salaries. And so if you want to be able to continue to operate, continue to hit the high marks that we have, we have to somehow figure out how we can do a two-step dance here. And that two-step dance began with the reductions, and now we're asking for investments. Presented a different way, we shared with you the black bar would be going back to 2009, 2010. The red bar is how much per pupil increase the legislature did provide to public schools. The black bar is the amount of money if it was tied to inflation. Move forward, right? What we do know is that in 2011, 2012, Act 10 made a huge reduction of 5% in major changes with regards to salaries for uh, licensed staff, with regards to health care, and their contribution to retirement. In 2016, you see an asterisk, and that was the last time the district did ask for support and investment in an operating levy. But as you can see, from 2016, 2016, 17, 2018, 2019, no additional money came in. And then you see the red bar of two years of funding. Okay? You can see that there's a gap between the red bars and the black bars. You heard Baird Financial share with you that that came out to about $3,800 per pupil difference if it had been tied to inflation. And in fact, in 20, 2009, yep, 2009, it used to be tied, per pupil rates were tied to inflation, and they decoupled that. Prescott Public Schools would have been receiving $4 million more this year if the legislature did not decouple that legislative law. So you can see that is why 91 schools are going forward for operating over 85% of all public schools have had to go to their local community to ask for that investment. Now, the Prescott Public Schools, and as a school board, you have not sat uh, silent. You have made 
contributions. Earlier tonight, you made an effort to prepay high interest loans at 4 and 5%, saving another $450,000 for our community. Again, those are dollars that go in one pocket. They can't be commingled. They can't go into Fund 10. But it is saving money by us not having to levy. In addition, we took uh, and participated with our community in a voter-approved bonds to upgrade all of our oldest buildings. So Malone Elementary, the 1220 Middle School, and um, the Intermediate School are now more energy efficient by the end of this summer. They will have LED lighting, putting and, uh, putting and mitigating all utility costs, and also becoming more energy efficient. They are more comfortable buildings for students and staff. When they're comfortable, they're able to be engaged. They continue to be able to participate in the instruction and allowing us to promote learning. That is why we exist, to make sure that we promote learning, and I believe we've delivered on that promise. In addition, you have asked me and our administrative team and teachers. Our teachers have been looking at curriculum. They've been looking at all of the educational software. We spend over a quarter million dollars on additional software that we integrate with our one-to-one -one, uh, technology 612, and we are starting to look at and reduce uh, costs there. And we'll continue to make those adjustments where and when we can. But those reductions and understand is that it is very difficult to balance a budget solely on cuts and to still be vibrant and provide the types of opportunities that you saw students here over the last couple months present to you from our theater students, from our forensics and speech, to our students in the athletics um, and the performing arts. Where those reductions will be coming from is the slice of the pie would be is that four hundred to four hundred eighty thousand dollars will come from staff reductions we have had resignations we have had um, staffing both at the administrative assistants who have stepped down or retired early and each time we are not reposting and we are looking at whether or not we can combine change or modify the roles and responsibilities that are in place in addition, in working with uh, Tim Runquist since COVID, more parents have been continuing to drive students. We do have a decrease of about 65 students, as we mentioned. Out in the country routes, we do know that we can consolidate three routes into two. It makes sure that two of the buses are fully, uh, um, we are full <coughs> capacity on two buses rather than having three buses not at full capacity. That will save an additional $70,000 by reducing the need for a driver, the wear and tear on buses, and the replacement cycle. Then every administration, administrator and supervisor has been asked to look at their current budget and make reductions this year and continue to make up to ten dollars to $15,000 of recommendations. These are reductions that are and will occur by fall 2024 regardless of whether or not April 2nd is successful. So you will see these decreases across the board based on materials, and those are things that we believe are in the best interest, and a lot of it some is an adjustment with some of our class sizes. And so as an example, we have put up what the recommended class sizes are, A5. It's a little bit more challenging at the secondary, and I'll explain how that plays out. But what you can see is that we have class sizes that are either below or right at the lower level of the ranges that are in place. So when you think about kindergarten, our ranges um, are 18 to 21. The elementary, K-5, is about 18 to 26 as a board recommendation, right? Obviously, if we had 22 students enroll, um, we're not going to necessarily create an additional section. That's why it's not a policy, but basically targets that we're aiming for. But you can see that our class sizes this year at kindergarten are smaller than the ranges. And we'll continue to make course corrections to make sure that we're more efficient in allocating staff in a more appropriate way. When you get to middle school, where you're going to see the changes, it will be specifically around whether or not the referendum is successful. If the referendum is successful, we're able to maintain a middle school model that allows students what we call into exploratories. 
At high school, you call it electives. There's a little bit more choice, a little bit more independence. At middle school, we're not giving them quite much of the choice. We want to force students out of their comfort level, get them that, um, uh, what we would say is kind of the um, positive struggle, if you will, to make sure that they're exploring music, they're exploring the arts, they're exploring STEM, and going outside of the four core academic areas. So obviously the class sizes for next year are highly dependent with regards to the decision by our community. Um, the question that will appear on the ballot is specifically to uh, read, shall the school district of Prescott, Pierce County, Wisconsin, be authorized to exceed the revenue limit specified in section 121.91 Wisconsin statutes? That goes back to schools cannot raise any additional money. The only way they get additional money is on per pupil aid, and that is already fixed for next year. Nothing will change until after January 2025. <coughs> Given that, we are asking our community to invest $1.2 million beginning for the fall of 2024 for recurring purposes. And that goes back to the things that we require to operate our schools each and every day. However, we also have to have a plan B. And that plan B has been worked on. These are both, you notice, slides that are appearing on our website. They have been shared with the community. They have been shared in presentations uh, with the uh, Chamber of Commerce, with Kiwanis, and meet with the Lions Club next week. Um, so the information is out there and also appeared in the Cardinal Connection, which was sent to 100% of people that live in the uh, Prescott school boundaries. This is over and above the 650 that is already in place and occurring. That is, is that you would see another half million dollars of staffing reductions needing to take place. What does that mean? It means 15 people, 15 faces. Go on our website, look at our directories by school, and you can start to see the faces that that would impact, impact and then ultimately impact with regards to programming. The, the, the 15 staff is not specific only to teachers. It cuts across the district office, it would cut across um, athletics, it would cr cut across extracurriculars, it would cut across front offices. You name it, it will be something that would have to um, occur. In addition, we would be looking at any consolidation of departments when we can. Understand that that means that people who would not be receiving pay increases would have more work added to their plate. That is not something that typically keeps people for long retention, especially if other districts have um, additional monies or referendum supported there. We also have to start to remake, eliminate anything that is not required. And so this is where the class sizes at high school and uh, middle school start to change because we are not required to have band and choir. We're required to have musical opportunities for students and instruction. We're required to have PE, but the instructional minutes are not always based on how we set up a schedule at the middle school so that we can make sure that all students are rotating through the different exploratory options. So that would mean that at the middle school, we would have to start to modify the types of programs and the amount of minutes, and so you might see us having to consolidate a band and choir offering into something that would be streamlined into music. You might have to see a consolidation of a 612 choir and band if we're able to do it, but it would mean, again, staff going across buildings, not very efficient, but that is what we would be required to do in order to sustain those choices if that's what we were going to do. So these are very difficult. They're not things that anybody is looking forward to having to do. In town busing, within a two mile radius, public schools are not reimbursed for any fuel or costs associated with transportation within two miles. That is something that the Prescott Public Schools does. We do it in partnership also with parochial schools. And it is something that we believe is in the best interest of our students but it would be a challenge to continue to run buses 
that take up fuel, that take up and have salaries, and also require buses that are $125,000 plus on an annual basis for us to purchase. That would be high at the high end of a need to be eliminated because there is no revenue coming in, and if there's not revenue to come in, it's hard to justify that. Same type of thing. We're talking about when revenue is not coming in, what do we do with courses that go above and beyond? And so those are some of the things that we would have to start to look at. Yes. I, I just I add a little color to this slide. I know there's there's a lot on here. It's it's a big list. It is a real list. I, I just I want to re just remind people when we when we had our, our referendum. I think it was in 2015 that failed. It was a, I think it was for 1.7. Plus a million. I can't remember exactly what it was for, but I was right around that. And we had, I don't, maybe we didn't do a very good job communicating this type of information to people because it, it ended up failing. We had to come back the following year and ask for a smaller number, and, and it passed overwhelmingly. Like it, I, I just, I distinctly remember being on the board. People were like, I can't believe that didn't pass. How, you know, we didn't realize it was going to be this. There's going to be this much cut, and. <clears throat> This is real. I, I just I, I want I want people to understand that. Let this sink in. If it doesn't pass, this is not a scare tactic. We're we're trying to do our best to communicate to people what we are going to have to consider as a board um, to make reductions of 1.2 million. It's obviously there's more than 1.2 million because that's what we directed Rick to do. We want we want to have a larger list so we can have options and choices to make. But it is it is absolutely real that if it doesn't pass, there's going to be a lot of a lot of cuts. And the last round, the last time it, a referendum didn't pass in this district, it was it was one of the toughest months, two months of, of making cuts. And, and you're dealing with people. You guys sit in the audience right now that are on the that were that were on. That, that was a, that was very very difficult to do when you're letting people go. And I, I just this slide needs to sink in for people as to what you're voting for. If you if, if you do choose to vote no, this, know that that we we are the, the the stuff on this slide is real, and, and we're going to have to make some really tough choices. Go ahead, Rick. No, I appreciate um, that, and I think the on the bottom you'll see that. People have asked about the athletic seat, uh, and basically what we've been talking about is we still want to make sure our kids, in the best possible, we're going to try to continue to operate so that students have some choices and opportunities, but we also have to be able to say there's going to be a limit. You can only stretch the rubber band so far. So WIA athletics would be available, but to be able to house uh, a C team, paying coaches, traveling, that would not be able to be sustained, and so that would mean less opportunities for students, but um, it is something that would have to um, be considered for the reduction. We obviously would be uh, removing any of the non-conference, some of the overnight trips and things like that. Some of it, people have asked, well, boosters can pay for it, but sooner or later, we're not going to be able to keep tapping boosters for all of it. And there's still an expense because we have staff that are leaving, and then we're having subs. And so these are things that um, it would be a very difficult uh, scenario. It is a scenario that if it is what we have to execute, we have started, um, to, uh, started the conversations and alignment because it has to happen quick. There are statutes that are required, so after April 2nd, if it's successful, we move forward. If it's not successful, we move forward with uh, $1.2 million of cuts that have to be in place and um, notifying staff before the end of April. So we talked a little bit about in-town busing. Obviously, that cuts into um, um, all grade levels, we're talking about we run 4K programs and also partner with St. Joe's for busing. It impacts both parochial uh, public school and our 4K students. In addition, we talked a little bit about class sizes. Now I can tell you is that the question mark goes away, but I can tell you that class sizes at elementary would have to increase and they would increase above 22. Um, and you would see class sizes um, probably above uh, at the higher end at, um, all the way up through fifth grade. Um, now, what is a recurring referendum? It's about 
ensuring that the robust programs that are in place, that the performance that you've seen and witnessed, and that the people that have delivered on that are able to remain. And so that is ultimately what's at uh, stake for our kids. We would have to reduce also programs, right? So programs that go beyond the regular educational program other than special education. So students who tend to struggle and where they're pulled out or getting an additional bump or booster within the academic, <coughs> that would probably be uh, eliminated. Programs that go beyond basic classroom instruction would be reduced K-5. When you get into middle school, we're talking about theater, musical programs, and performances. There's nothing that's required to run those. Um, obviously, there is a gate, but the gate does not <coughs> come for um, the um, lights, the soundboards, the maintenance of the, or the payment of our staff that leave that. We talked about the C team athletics, obviously class sizes, at, uh, for the high school, what you would start to see is that electives would have to be paired back and that the amount of choices that students have. This has had an impact because we already had registration, but we have not been able to move forward with creating class lists or um, aligning class schedules because we don't know whether or not we'll be able to sustain all of those until after April 2nd. So the work that we've been doing to be prepared and get, have student selection has been on pause. And we know that there's two roads, and that's why I continue to say we're at a crossroads. And we have to determine which way we're going to go as a community, not as a school board alone, and not as a superintendent alone, but as a community. We do understand that there is an impact on taxpayers. We shared this previously, and I just want to be clear, is that the impact on a $200,000 house, a $300,000 house, a $400,000 house, would increase. On a monthly basis, it ranges from $13 to $27. If you annualize that out, it is an increase of $160 for a $200,000 house. Each increment is about $80 be $240 and $320 a year, okay? So what we're talking about is an impact. Historically, when you look at the proportion of money that's collected on tax property, the proportion that is coming to the Prescott Public Schools has decreased over time. Historically, in the early 2015s, we were in, uh, in a mill rate of 12 point uh, 2 to 2, 12.4, it dropped into the 10s, it has precipitously dropped um, below 10 into 8.54, it is currently at 7.7, .7. the proportion of money from tax property, for property taxes has decreased. It would increase, it would increase to 8.5, and it would be the equivalent proportion of what people were paying on their property as it was two years ago. Even though inflation has gone up much dramatically, right? So we understand that it is an ask. We understand that it is an investment in our local community. We believe that we have done a job that has been able to share with you what has been available for our students. And we would like you to hear from our students. Our life is as we choices. Choices. Choices that define us, connect us, and shape our journey. We also decide who surrounds us. Because while there are communities we're born into, we choose to be a part of the Cardinal Nation. Being a Cardinal means Friday night lights and Saturday dance competitions. It's taking center stage as the curtain parts. It's cheering alongside people you've never met, yet considering them family. Because together, we've been through all kinds of adversity. As Cardinals, we embrace our differences because we also have shared values and shared aspirations. And that common ground can forge connections, share experiences that build bridges and transcend barriers. We're never too old to learn and never too young to teach. Being a Cardinal means endless pursuit of excellence. It's a commitment to winning in all facets of life. It means having the ambition to reach higher and together putting in the work to get there. Success here is no accident. We create our future and unlock greatness. We may leave this awesome place, but it never leaves us.
single second, remember that you have a choice. A choice that will impact every student, every classroom, and every school. So if anyone ever asks me about your best choices we've ever made, tell them you support Prescott Schools. And you don't have a crowd with it. So, as you can see, public education is the cornerstone of any community. It has touched and has incredible amount of opportunities for our future leaders. We believe um, that we've done everything we can to be able to communicate out. We hope that people make an informed decision. You have an invite, a standing invite, to participate in an open house on the 24th here at Prescott High School. We'll have school board members, myself, finance, and um, happy to answer, answer any questions that people have. Um, and we hope that people will at least make an informed decision on April 2nd, um, which is Tuesday after our break. Any comments or questions from the last week or the last month with regards to the very presentation? Yeah, and I mean, maybe this is just an opportunity if we want to go around the board. If you have any closing thoughts before we end the meeting tonight, and on, on, on the referendum itself, your final thoughts here. Tanya, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, you <laughs> no. Um, it's just hard to. I, I watch that video and it almost makes me tear up every time. And I think about um, the opportunities that our kids have in the school district from the programming that we put in place. I was also on the board uh, when the last operating one did not pass. And it, I mean, we heard from the community loud and clear after they understood how it would impact each of the families individually, their community members, their neighbors, that it, it's not what the community wanted. And we ended up going back pretty quickly um, for something at a much lower, but not before we had cuts, we lost great staff, we had, it was, it was pretty horrific. Um, I am, I'm confident that um, our community sees the value in our school district and our students and our programming. It, we talk in here and things that we can add to this video is that we were um, all the way through from like little littles to the gathering space by providing um, locations and services and programming and staff that works with that. So it's not just our school age children that, that stuff like this impacts. Um, I'm, I'm so very proud of working with, uh, with this district, um, of the things that we do. I brag about it all the time. My kids are proud of being here and I you know I hope we can continue to, to function at this high high rate. I encourage everyone April 2nd. I will be there this this weekend, um, so I'll be at that presentation too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, the uh, video was great. Dr. Scusi did great. Tony, great comments. In an effort not to not to repeat any of that, it is kind of our you know final comments here. You know, I think um, you know maybe from just a little bit different perspective. Um, I think about Prescott Schools and, and what it means to the community. Um, you know, it's. It is the hub. If we are not the largest, we're one of the largest employers um, in the town, uh, in the region. Um, I think about uh, you know what COVID uh, showed is is the role that that our schools, our buildings, our, our faculty, our staff play beyond the academics, the arts, and the athletics, um, and what a different place uh, we would have been um, if the schools weren't here. Um, I think about um, all the positives, and uh, and you know we have we have nice facilities, right? We have uh, we have great staff. Uh, our, our facilities, you know, are are great, and 
and uh, we've been supported by the community. But you know, it's not full of thrills. I think I think that uh, this board and previous boards and administrations have done a great job of balancing uh, the wants and the needs, um, and 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 uh, uh, being stewards of taxpayers' dollars to make sure that their investments are high performing. And uh, uh, I see that as one of our main roles moving forward is, is, is certainly to continue that. Um, I think that I look at some of the cuts and, um, you know, I cringe at the people side, um, regardless of some of those tough decisions. Um, for me personally, just a non-starter to think about pay freezes. Uh, I know pay freezes are real. They're real in the private sector. Many of us uh, have, have encountered them, but um, uh, to me, that's a last resort. Um, you know, moving forward with that, uh, I think about busing. I think about uh, uh, daylight saving situations and and our ability to help serve. You know, and I, I count St. Joe's as part of our, our school district as well. And kids walking to school in the dark, and and I know more parents are dropping their kids out, but not every parent has that availability to do so. And and I don't like those decisions. And um, our schools are really, really important to this community and every community. And um, um, you know, I, I, I certainly ask for the community support. Um, I'm a taxpayer. I don't like paying additional taxes. Nobody does. That's a no-brainer, right? Nobody wants to pay additional money, but uh, the benefits certainly, uh, in my opinion, outweigh uh, the risks. And so uh, I hope the community shows up uh, in full force. I hope we see a lot of people this Sunday. Uh, to ask the questions they haven't been able to ask. I think the website's a fantastic resource. I'm proud of the information the district has been able to put out, and uh, and, I, and I hope people digest it. So. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that uh, you know, some of the points Tanya and Pat made, for sure, some of the same thoughts that I had tonight. And like Tanya, every time, I don't even have kids, and this is just a great place. Um, the teachers are fantastic. I know teachers, they put their hearts into what they do. And I just think if we keep piling more and more on, we're just going to start losing. Losing teachers, losing programs. I, it's amazing what our kids have done. They've gone on to achieve scholarships in athletics. They're achieving academic scholarships. They've been given opportunities here to explore and see what's out there and see what fits for them. If they're struggling, we've got the staff here to help take care of them. And we know after COVID, God, we needed that. And we made that investment. We knew some of the people we hired, we knew that we were doing it. We weren't gonna have the money. We had COVID dollars to do it. And we knew we needed to have it. And we did because the test scores show it. The, the discipline has gone down. The suspensions have gone down. We're, we're helping the students who need help. Um, the state has put us in this position. The state has put every single community in this position. They've told the taxpayers, this is up to you. You get to figure out how you want your school districts to run. You figure out what you want it to be and what you want to fund it. They're not giving us more. They're not supporting what they're making us do, as we heard tonight. Um, they give us mandates and don't fund it. Um, yeah, we need to keep this district where it's at. I think we have some amazing programs here that other places don't have. We have STEM. We're the only place around here that has STEM for, for little kids. And that's huge. That's giving these kids opportunities so when they do get into high school, they want to explore and they want to look at all those different options they have. Um, and yeah, I think we need everybody to step up. It's going to be hard, and the the idea too that we support. You know, we've got PCR, we've got community ed that comes off of our school district budget. We pay for that. We help. We want the community to be involved. Um, 
we have people participating from not just here in Prescott, but we have people who come to community ed and community rec from across the river in Hastings come over here and do stuff because we offer such great programs. So I hate to see any of that stuff have to get cut, but this is where the state has put us. They've, they've given us the opportunity to create our district how we want to create it. We, we have that power. Um, and I really, really hope that everybody goes out and votes on April 2nd. Boy, I try not to repeat anything because you guys have a lot of great comments, but I mean, just, yes, the state has pushed the decisions down to the local communities to decide whether or not they want to fund public schools. That's a bottom line. So we're not the only school district in Wisconsin that, that's dealing with this right now. Obviously, Rich has pointed out the, the numbers on, on all the districts that are going for referendum. So, it's it's an unfair formula. We got a, we got a district that is north of us by 20 minutes that gets a thousand dollars more per student per student. In in the same in in they're 20 minutes away from us. If we had a thousand dollars more per student, we wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't be asking for money. So it, it it's an unfair formula. Where Prescott is on the short end of the stick on a lot of things. I'm proud of how our district has managed the finances that we've been in, that we've managed. We're, we had a pretty flat budget for the last three years. And since Rick has come on, he's had to make a lot of changes over the last eight, nine years to really try to tighten up the budget and, and find efficiencies and find ways to, to stretch dollars. And I, I think we're one of the most, we're one of the most efficiently run school districts I'll say in the state. I, I, I'll say it. I think we're one of the most efficient, efficiently run school districts in the state with the dollars that we get. So there's no, there's just no other way to squeeze money out of out of the budget to make to make this work. We're 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 going to cut another six fifty because of of reasons that Rick pointed out. You know, our enrollment's dropping. So there's areas where we can where we can make changes, but it's we're we're squeezing out as much as we possibly can here and and. There was one slide earlier, really, you don't have to go back to it, Rick, but it's that, it's that first slide where we got the biennium budgets and, and what, what the blue line does for where, where that puts us, where it puts our fund balance. And we, we back in, I don't know, at the beginning of this whole conversation last year, why did we choose 1.2 million? Well, that, the reason why we chose 1.2 million and not a lower number is because we felt 1.2 million got us through three biennium budget cycles. It gets us to basically 20, 29, 20, 20, 30, before we start getting into this problem again where we're gonna be running below uh, our, where we wanna be for our fund balance. So we got we give the state three biennium cycles to try to figure out if they, if they wanna make changes or not. If they don't, we're gonna be back. I, I mean, we will be back in, in six to eight years from now. Hopefully not, but I, I mean, that, that's, that's we can't project out any further than that. We wanted six years because it gives us a chance to, to do a lot of planning in that time. I mean, there's things that we can look at in the meantime um, with our facilities as well. So that's why the 1.2 million. We didn't go after a $1 million incremental increase like River Falls did because tax impact would have been far greater. And we know how, how, how much uh, this, this community's taxed already. I'm part of Prescott, we're all part of Prescott. We just got reassessed. We're, in, we're gonna get, you know, our, most people's property already went up. So I, as, a, as a tax paying citizen, yeah, this, this is gonna impact my taxes and it's gonna be a choice that I will gladly make on April 2nd to, to fund schools. But it's a choice everybody's gonna have to make and how it impacts their budget. And, and, and I know it's a tough choice. But it is one that, that we're all being asked to make. As a school board, it was, our, it was our job, it was our responsibility to bring it to the community and not take the choice out of your hands. We don't want to make that choice to say, no, we're not going to, we're going to cut 1.8 million on the budget. We want the, we want the community to make that choice. And that's why we're here. So it's a community decision. I hope everybody does their own homework. I hope everybody gets informed and, and, and gets their, all their questions answered. I know there was one question that was answered, probably waiting for an answer. I'd like to uh, explore the numbers a little bit further that you gave us, and I don't think we're prepared to answer it right now, uh, Stuart. So if, if we can maybe talk afterwards. That's just one thing. Uh, maybe wait till the community. Uh, if you want to come to approach us after, that's fine. But I, I just don't think we're ready to answer that. 
I, but it's all, all questions are good questions, and if you want, we need to answer. We're, we're, we'll try to answer everything, every question we can. Um, so, if Sunday will be a, another opportunity for that as well. I think you, there's probably good opportunity on Sunday to have that question answered as well as other questions. But again, it's a it's your decision, and and I, I hope folks are informed enough to make a uh, make a good decision and go vote. So appreciate everybody sticking around. It's been a long long journey to get us to this point and I guess now it's it's really up to the community at this point. So uh, any final closing thoughts here guys? Gerald? Rick? Good. Alright. Um, thank you. That concludes that uh, that uh, item that uh, went on for a while, but that's okay. It's our last chance here. Item D, Rick. It's just anticlimactic because we already talked about it, but just a reminder, March 24th, open house. Any questions, please uh, stop by 12.30 to 1.30, and we'll be at the uh, in the commons area at the Prescott High School. All right. Uh, now we will have recognition of visitors. If you want to come up, quick, go. Yep. Thanks for sticking around this whole meeting. So yeah, I understand he's going to run numbers, and that's fine. I'm fine with that as long as it guess, gets to me or to the public at some point. Um, I guess my other question would be is for some grace of God, because I agree with you guys that the state has failed, right? I, full disclosure, talked to our state rep ourselves, and that's exactly where I got these numbers from. Um, and his response, although I did vote for him, I'll be admit, wasn't the greatest. But at the same time, you know, some numbers were there. But for some grace of God, I guess, if the state pulls their heads out of you nowhere, you know, what's what's the district's plan then with this levy? Because we already got one in place, too. And that's going to be additional on top of this. And like we all said, we're all being taxed at the wazoo. I've lived here since 2020. Taxes got up 60% in four years. It's concerning. And we just had a new judicial building get approved, too, which isn't a ton of an increase, but it's going to be an increase. So I'm just wondering what the district's plan is then with these levies, if we do get additional funding, I doubt it will happen, but what the plan is, I guess. Because it's reoccurring. It's, yeah, because it's reoccurring. It's for, there's, no, there's no limitation on it. And that's, my full disclosure is my, my biggest issue with it, is yeah. that it's a lot of money. I, I'm for the school. I, we moved here for this school, not just because it's a beautiful place to live, but we did our research. I have kids in this thing. I have kids that are in a lot of different activities in this, this school district. And it's just kind of dis, you know, disenlightening a little bit when in the four years I've been here, this is the second referendum that we've had. Voted for the last one because it's needed. We get old buildings. I get it. Came from a father that did construction company his whole life. So I get that. At the same time, it's, that it's just continually to increase with no real end to it. So I just want to know what your guys' opinions, I guess, is we do get more funding and stuff does get, does get straightened out because our governor now is just last week signed new stuff into place for schools and it's looking maybe that we will, but who knows. So if you guys could answer that, that'd be great. So normally we don't answer questions if it's not on the agenda. I so, but I think like, to. like I think it's a key. Yeah, it, yeah. Given that we've spoken to this and with permission, yes, right? go ahead. I, I think you, you you answered it. I think um, it's levy up to a certain you know one point maybe one point two million here in this case. But so it, if if we don't need it all, then we wouldn't have to levy it all. It's, it gives us the flexibility to say we levy up to one point two million. So if the state comes in with a financial windfall by miracle by happenstance, then then it gives us a it basically gives us the right not to levy as much. We don't have to levy 1.2. We can levy less. So that that's the hook, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Don't forget to state your name in your municipality. Tesslin Magnuson, can you hear? Uh, Prescott, and I have one alumni, one senior who may, may make it over the finish line. Um, I just want to offer an alternative perspective about why I will be voting for the referendum on April 2nd. I don't understand school funding. And now I've spent the last three years researching 
all things school district, and I still don't understand school funding. So here's why. Somewhere out there is a daughter or a son. I, mine, mine are gonna go. Mine have benefited from this experience at this high school. Um, but there's another kid out there who will refuse to go to school for a very long time, who will need special ed, who will need the safety of a choir room and social emotional learning. And I will be voting yes to support that kid and that parent who will desperately need the special ed team to guide them through this and the special ed teachers and the principals and the people who listen when you try and encounter and navigate through your kids growing up. So I try to intake all the financials, but I vote for that kid and that parent who need this school, need that special ed, need that choir room, which saved my daughter's life. So that's it. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, thank you everybody. I think we'll take the next item as a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned. Thank you everybody for coming out. Appreciate it.